above a land of dragons and myth, the mountain of Gangkar Punsam soars almost five miles to the sky. For Western mountaineers, it is the highest peak in the world to remain unclimbed. Flanked by a massive buttress, the way to its summit is guarded by a treacherous ridge corniced by wind-driven snow. Gangkar Pansam promises a test piece as difficult as the Himalayas can provide, and the climax of a dream that began three years ago for expedition leader Steve Berry. It was very exciting for me personally getting to base camp after the three years of intense hard work and struggle getting the money together for the expedition. And it was very ironic that just as we arrived at base camp, the, uh, the mists started to slowly clear and it was like the mountain was flirting with us. She was saying, look, look how beautiful I am and look how hard it's going to be. The international team he leads is a forceful one, in which individual prowess has been strengthened by years of shared experience together in the world's mountain ranges. Among them, Jeff Jackson, like most of the expedition's members, gained his first taste of the Himalayas with Steve Berry on the giant Cho Oyu. From North America, Jeff won his mountaineering experience the hard way, on the rock and ice pinnacles of Alaska. Jeanette Harrison's fascination with the problems of medicine at high altitude led her first to Colorado, where she studied with the world's leading authorities, and now to the Himalayas as the expedition's doctor. Steve Findlay works with maladjusted children, and the temperament that suits him for this is reflected in the style of his climbing, power exercised with a fine sensitivity. The task they have set themselves is a formidable one. First, they must surmount the pinnacle on the right. Beyond, the 4,000-foot ridge that leads to the summit itself has already defeated two previous attempts. At the eastern end of the Himalayan chain that divides India from China, Ganga Punsam lies in the ancient kingdom of Bhutan. A kingdom almost untouched by the influence of the world outside. It has been inaccessible by road or air for all but the last two decades. Its situation is unique. The high fertile valleys framed and hidden by the mighty Himalaya. The people and their culture have inspired countless dreams of utopia or a perfect way of life. The search for a mythical Shangri-La. The agriculture of Bhutan like that of its Himalayan neighbors, is shaped by the mountains themselves. But Bhutan, more than anywhere else, has remained aloof from the short-term temptations of so-called development. <laughs> Archery is the kingdom's national sport, a tradition that dates from the 15th century, when invading Tibetans and Mongols from the north were driven back by Bhutanese warriors on the frozen battlefields of the high border valleys. Now those far-off days are remembered as Bhutan's 14 monastery districts come together to commemorate the military victories that preserved their religion and culture to the present day. At each end of the field, competing teams score points by hitting their opponent's target. The defending team attempts to stop the metal-tipped arrows finding their marks by invoking the spirits with chants and flags. A winning arrow calls not just for celebration, but for thanks to the spirits for their favours. The great Zongs of Bhutan symbolize the power of religion in dominating and directing the lives of its people.
It is here in these monastery fortresses that the Bhutanese architectural tradition finds its highest expression, a tradition that began in the 8th century when Tantric Buddhism was first established in Bhutan by Guru Rinpoche, the second Buddha. And in Bhutan, the quality of life is measured by values based on that Buddhist tradition which has such a profound effect upon every aspect of its people's existence. In this country where crime is virtually unknown, religion is never far beneath the surface. Three thousand feet above the Paro Valley is the most outstanding of Bhutan's architectural achievements, Taksang Zong. According to legend, the Guru Rinpoche flew there from Tibet on the back of a tiger in the year 747, thus giving it the name Tiger's Nest. The cave from which the Guru spread Bhutan's Buddhism is where the original monastery was built. Today it is a site of great religious significance, a place of pilgrimage and meditation. Many festivals are celebrated in Bhutan, where dances are performed by monks and laymen alike. The dance of the black hats is one of the most beautiful of these dances. It commemorates the slaying of the Tibetan king Langdama, persecutor of Buddhism, in the year 842. His assassin was a monk who hid his bow and arrows within the folds of his long sleeves. <laughs> For the Bhutanese, these festivals are unique occasions to prove their religious fervor, but also decked out in their smartest clothes to exchange the latest news. The dance of the judgment of the dead shows the characters whom every Bhutanese will meet after his death and teaches him not to fear them. It shows the importance of good or bad deeds in earthly life, or karma, on which rebirth with a good or bad destiny depends. From the Bhutanese capital of Timpu, the team leaves for the mountains. A road, recently completed as part of an Indian government aid project, takes them as far as the Bumtang Valley, at this roadhead, the expedition will pick up the supplies they need for the approach march. Steve Berry. After only three hours from Thimpu, we came across this huge roadblock with hundreds of tons of the cliff just collapsed onto the road. I felt immediately that, well, we could be here for three or four days and the delays could go on and on and nothing would happen and people would not clear the road quickly enough. And I felt an urgent need to get on and get things done. More delays. So when they have to blast the big ones here, when they blast the big one, the other big one is going to come down. So it's going to take some time. If you can just, you know, if they can blast it slowly, if you can just cut off this much out here, then you can pass through. So there's no alternative. We have to get this blasted out of the yes, way. We have to open this road. And so no we might be road. stuck here for two days. Fortunately, help in the form of an Indian government road gang is not that far away. Do you think you'll be able to clear this? Yeah. Yeah. It'll take you three hours. Ah. Are you not afraid that the rest of the cliff will come onto the road? 
How, how many sticks of dynamite will you use? A small, small one. In a country where motor vehicles are a novelty, the use of dynamite to keep roads open promises a spectacle worth waiting for. Clay is used to pack the dynamite and intensify the effect of the explosion. By nightfall, the way through to the roadhead is clear. Jeanette Harrison. After such a long, hard day, six hours of blasting the landslide, it's, it's such a relief to at last arrive at Bumtang to meet with the Bhutanese guides and Yeshe, our climbing guide. We were struck by how open and friendly they were, always singing, always happy and jolly. We were to take about 20 local Bhutanese people up to base camp with us, some of them as our kitchen staff to cook for us and some to drive the yaks that will be carrying our gear. Before they leave for the mountains, however, Bhutan presents them with another opportunity to taste the richness of its culture. The head lama of the great monastery fortress Bayakar Zong presides over a four-day festival of blessing. For those who attend, it is a cleansing experience that improves karma, their journey through the cycle of reincarnation. And for Jeff Jackson, a further opportunity to enjoy the open-heartedness of the country's welcome. I've always been interested in uh, Buddhism, and um, this whole country is sort of pulled together into one basic thought. The people are a lot more friendlier and more responsive to you as a foreigner and not so just in awe, which I thought would, might be the case. And it's just a beautiful country. It is that Shangri-La image of just rolling hills and unspoiled wilderness. It's amazing. It's fantastic just to talk to these people and go gambling with them and play their games of chance and things and uh, it's all in good fun. They like, seem to really enjoy having us here as visitors and I feel extremely comfortable here. I don't feel out of place or um, I'm just 
ready to get up into the hills and start walking around. You know, it's, I feel fantastic just being able to see all. Tomorrow it's all gonna really start for us. Go catch up with our horses, load our gear on, and start the walk in towards the mountain. From Bumtang, their path takes them north to the mountains. Local guides lead them into uncharted terrain. For the first two days, they will take horses. Then in the high country, they will transfer their baggage to yaks. Steve Berry. We left Bumtang on the 16th of September with 61 horses carrying all our equipment. And this is the, uh, actually the, the best time of the trip for me. I enjoy the walk in more than anything else. It's a time when I can forget about all the organizational problems and just enjoy the beautiful countryside. For Jeanette, the walk in is a chance to weigh up the medical problems the team may face. As the medical officer on the expedition, it was a time when I was most worried that people were going to be struck down with diarrhea, any of the tropical illnesses that were likely to afflict them, as well as problems of altitude. Um, we were lucky on the trip in that everybody remained pretty healthy, including the Bhutanese. Well, we, when we were in uh, India, we had this really, really old piece drive me off and got incredibly sick. Yeah. <laughs> Any feet? That'll go pretty yeah. quick. Got fig and ginger cakes. Steve Monks has just completed a solo ascent of the infamous north wall of the Eiger. The contrast between the clockwork precision of Switzerland and the unmapped isolation of Bhutan is extreme. The country itself is so much less developed. I mean, it's still wild. And uh, I mean, I find that really intriguing. I mean, it's unexplored as well. I mean, you've had, you have maps into you know, any of the other places I've, I've been before. You don't need to rely on the local guide to tell you which way to go. It's so easy to get lost here if you got separated from people and you wouldn't know what to do. Harry Macaulay will put organizational skills to work as base camp manager. For him, the lure of the unknown is irresistible. Ever since I was a young boy, I've always been enthralled by faraway places where other people have never been. Where you can push yourself to limits, where you've got the elements against you and you've got all the other factors which you get in risk sports. It's very hard to describe to anybody what it's like to actually live in that sort of environment all the time. The scale of everything is just mind-blowing. It makes everything you've ever come across before seem minuscule. Beside the river, a hot spring erupts where the deep valley has cut down to intercept an underground stream, warmed by heat from the Earth's core. I don't know about you, Harry, but I reckon those last two days were too hard. They were too long. They're much longer than anything yeah, we ever... It wouldn't be too bad if we were expecting them, but they were... The hour and a half was just on and on and on. <laughs> hour and a half after hour and a half. It was just four hours, isn't it? Yeah. Hour yeah. 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 It provides welcome relief for aching limbs, and the expedition's first break for five days. What's it like? New Zealander Lydia Brady made her mark with audacious ascents of the great rock climbs of North America's Yosemite Valley. She has committed herself to a life of adventure. Just the feeling of, I suppose, power over your environment is something that I've become to appreciate, especially over the last couple of years where I've, um, I'm strong enough to climb a mountain on my own. And I'm strong enough to get myself out of situations. That's one of the, the biggest emotional triggers that I've discovered in the last couple of years. It's kept me going and climbing. First of all, you're learning and you just think, oh, well, you know, after I've learned it all, I'm just going to be going up and down mountains all the time. But then you suddenly realise that there's more, there's more and more epic situations that you could get yourself into. But as more experienced you get and the older you get, the more capable you are of getting yourself out of those situations. So here you are in a position where you can 
get in get in a place in the world, a situation in the world, a moment or a time or a, a situation of danger that hardly anyone else in the world can ever experience, and you know that you can get yourself out of it. The fast-flowing rivers of the Himalayan foothills demand respect. A previous Japanese expedition crossing this bridge lost the yak which was carrying all their money. Its body was recovered below the gorge. Of the money, there was no trace. Steve Findlay is one who welcomes the rigours of the approach march. People have said that the walk-in is hard, and I, I guess it is hard, but uh, in some ways I'm quite glad of that. I certainly feel very fit at the moment after humping a 40-pound pack over a 15,000-foot pass. I feel pretty positive about the mountain, actually, that it's a beautiful route. You've got a good team of people here who uh, get on well, respect each other. Um, I think we can do it. On the seventh day after leaving Bumtang, they get the first sight of their objective. I would like to have done um, an alpine ascent, but um, due to the structure of the mountain and of the team, I don't think it's going to be possible. So I think we're going to have to compromise by putting up camps one and two, and then a small team, two or three people going for the summit from there. I'd like to be one of those people. I very much like to get to the summit of this mountain. I think we have to do it. Yeah, I'm sure it goes way down left. So we're almost out of sight. From the south east, really. Yeah. We might have to do it alpine, fairly alpine style, from camp two or three. Yeah. But the Japs couldn't fit in at camp three, could they? Two days will pass before they reach the mountain, but already a new sense of commitment is felt by the team. Jeff Jackson. This is my Olympics. This is my thing, you know, to go. Here's my chance to come to an unexplored country, go to a peak that hasn't been climbed at all. No routes have been put up on it yet. And to do a new route. I'm definitely not out to kill myself. I don't have any kind of death wish or anything like that. I want to come out of this as healthy as I can. I have no idea how difficult it might be, if we can do it for sure, whatever, everything points to the fact that we'll be able to, but this is like my creme de la creme or whatever, you know, this is the, a good chance for me, because there's not many places like this left in the world. Jeanette Harrison. Bhutan was a big chance for me because it, it was my first chance to go on a, a real big climbing expedition. Before that, most of my climbing had been on primarily medical research expeditions to study high altitude and acclimatization, and the climbing was just sort of an added extra. But uh, this one was going to be just climbing, and uh, a big mountain at that, a mountain that had never been climbed before. On September the 24th, base camp is established on the Col at the head of the Mangda Chu Valley, and the storm clouds of an approaching front move in. Here, the yak herders unload supplies and equipment to leave before snowfall hampers their return to Bumtang. <coughs> The next day it becomes apparent that the immediate practical problem is food. The Bhutanese government has supplied rations sufficient for only four days. If the staff are to eat, they have no alternative. They must slaughter one of the yaks that has helped them get here. Uh, Bhutan Tourism Temple, uh, this is Yishe at Gangal Prince Base Camp. 
Okay, uh, I'm here to report that the British Bhutan expedition to Mount Gangan Bizum has established its base camp at 5,050 meters. At the moment, the climbers are shifting their equipment to the advanced base camp. The way lies across the moraine, a shifting, treacherous mass of glacial rubble and ice. Harry McCauley. Steve and I were the first couple to get up to advanced base camp and erect a tent and dump some stuff. Uh, Funzo was amazingly fit and agile at crossing the moraine. Steve and I took a bit of time getting used to it. Within four days of reaching the mountain, the team established their advance base camp at 17,500 feet. Stephen Berry, 30th of September. Our first day's climbing on the mountain. It's great to get going. Steve, Finlay, Lydia and myself uh, plan today to do a reconnaissance just to find the best and safest route up onto the main ridge itself. I'm dying the line that we're going to take looks pretty easy, Steve. Yeah, most of it. Top to Steve, though. We might even find the remains of the Japanese and Austrian ropes, and Japanese ropes from 1985 won't be much use. But the Austrian ropes are only a couple of months old, and we're hoping that as long as they're not too buried in, in ice, we'll be able to make good use of them. The weather's looking quite good too, uh, so it's really good to get going. The first attempt on Gangkar Punsum was by the Japanese in 1985. Fixing ropes up the mountain, they followed an obvious gully and the ridge above until illness and bad weather overtook them. The Austrian team took a different line. They were stopped by the heavy snowfall of the advancing monsoon. So we then came back across this face. Back at advance base camp, known as ABC, Steve Berry and the reconnaissance party report to the rest of the team. I mean, we all <coughs> felt the same that uh, we didn't want to go up the Jap route because of the, the Serac threatening the lower half of it. And so we eventually decided to go up that uh, diagonal ramp that you can see there. Yeah. And we've put a load of um, food and a tent and uh, gear on top of that big rock you can see. Yeah, and then yeah, there's uh, some Jap fixed rope which is mostly buried. Do you reckon it'd be much of a job to get it out? Yeah. Mm, I pulled pretty hard on it and not yeah. much happened. Well, I think yeah. digging. the way you guys went is a lot better than either one of those other lines. It's the it's safest line. Yeah, right. it's the most right. direct up there too, right. it seems. It's the best line, yeah. Because yeah. that Austrian route, it looks like they must have gone lower than us i would think yeah and then they just cut in the jap gully real early yeah. it's very steep uh, well what are we going to do tomorrow that's the important thing to decide really isn't it now we're all here yeah uh i think lydia and myself should go up really and uh pick up the gear that we dumped to the top of the ramp and then uh, take off up to camp one and get yeah, camp sure. one established i think that's that's the most obvious thing to do the line taken by the Japanese is at constant risk of avalanche. Steve Berry proposes an alternative route to Camp 1. If they can find a way up the face to the left, they can rejoin the ridge above the ice cliffs which threaten the gully. It's a steeper line, but it must be safer. Steve Berry, 1st of October. Today will be the first attempt at uh, climb towards Camp 1. Steve and Lydia seem to be pairing up as a climbing team and look as though they're going very well together. Very strong and fit. At last, the real climbing begins. For Steve Findlay, the mind is freed to focus <coughs> at a deeper level. 
the lure of the big mountains, um, the view from something like 22,000 feet is indescribable. It gives you a, a sense of smallness. The fragility of human life really comes to the fore on a big mountain. There always is the chance of uh, dying on uh, one of these big things, but the dying for me isn't um, too frightening. I'm not really scared for myself, but scared for my family more. Lydia is a very strong lady. She's um, intensely passionate about climbing. That's what all she wants to do, really. I think Lydia is going to be one of the uh, the strong climbers on the mountain. I've decided that I'm a climber. And one of the reasons why I want to go up on this mountain is because it makes you feel <coughs> special and unusual. Even mellow little mountains where you don't even need to have a rope or something like that, they can make you feel really special because there aren't too many people around you and you're seeing views that not many people in the world will ever see. A short traverse leads to the foot of the ramp. The ramp gradually steepens up to vertical snow fairly insubstantial snow, which makes it quite hard going. And then at the top of that, you top out onto a lovely little ridge from what we call the lunchtime spot, which is a slab of rock sticking out with superb views down to ABC. And, and Jeanette and Jeff were just sitting there having a rest day, because Jeanette's had six days in a row. It was wild. I like to sit in a spot and look around and just imagine myself in these mountains that I can see around me. But in this tiny little circle that was called Bhutan on the map of the world, that's neat because not too many people have been there. It's great being up there. It was a crystal clear day. You could see Chumulhari in the distance, and I think I could see Kanchenjunga. It must be hundreds of miles away. A great spot. Already they are ahead of schedule. The day's work takes them to a high point 2,000 feet above advanced base camp. We had to go right to the top of the ramp because I was crossing some snow. It was really deep, um, avalanche-prone snow. Pretty nasty stuff. Yeah, it was really nasty. It was desperate snow piling. So we fixed some rope just around the bottom, and we didn't fix any more as we went up. We climbed up the top of the ramp, and then Steve Finley did a really hard lead. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's really good. It's good to get on the mountain, though. It's really good to get a bit established on it. Yeah, we've got up to uh, halfway up to Cam 1, and we've got a, an more easy... That, yeah, probably more. And then uh, it looks pretty easy now up to Camp 1, up the ridge. And the first time I went up there, it was a bit of a scare actually. I pulled round the corner on some old ropes and the rope disappeared into the ice. And I couldn't see the rope coming out again. So I didn't know whether to pull on the rope or what. Pretty scary moment. There was about a 3,000 foot drop below me. but I'm just a bit grip here. Now I know that I've committed my life to going away on lots of adventures and lots of different things where life is so extreme and you, uh, you're always wearing long johns and you're always wearing a smelly dark blue top and things like that. I find I really value being able to come home and <laughs> put some nice clothes on, especially dresses, and do things like learn how to sew and, and cook. I mean, I get really domestic. It's really sickening. I suppose it's creating a situation where you're comfortable and you're warm and you're not in dire stress. You just feel special, you just feel tough and exciting. Beyond the ice cliff, Steve Findlay and Lydia are confronted by a band of steep rock. Here they find the ropes fixed by the Austrians, but unwilling to trust them, Steve climbs an independent line to reach the ridge. Above, although the climbing is straightforward, a new problem makes itself felt. Winds gusting at 60 and 70 miles an hour make further upward progress extremely difficult.
Camp 1 is finally fixed on the 3rd of October at an altitude of 20,500 feet. As the team extends itself on the mountain, other hazards arise. Jeanette Harrison explains. The higher the altitude, the more chance it is that people are going to develop altitude sickness and not just the symptoms of acute mountain sickness, the headache, nausea and so on, but more serious complications, pulmonary edema or fluid on the lungs, where people become very short of breath, develop a serious cough, may cough up blood and have to descend quickly if you're going to prevent um, fatal complications of cerebral edema, which is fluid around the brain, leading to coma and if, if nothing is done, in other words, if, if they don't descend in a hurry, then they will eventually die. At this sort of altitude, it's very difficult to move around. You get tired very quickly. And so all of us were taking turns going up and down to Camp 1 during this period, carrying loads to acclimatise properly. To coordinate these movements effectively, good communication is essential. Steve Berry at ABC to Camp 1. Are you receiving me? Over. Yeah, we're receiving you, ABC. How are things down there at the moment? It's pretty windy up here. Over. I'm surprised you haven't been blown off the side of the hill, actually. It looks as though there's a whole load of bad weather moving in, and, uh, and it's going to be snowing again before too long. Over. We're just going to press on for Camp 2 tomorrow, and just hope the weather holds. Can you see the others on the hill? Well, I can see somebody coming down the snow cone, and I can see somebody on the Japanese gully. I can also see Jeanette. Yeah, I can see Jeanette going up the bridge towards you. And confirm Steve Finlay and Lydia are returning to ABC for a rest. I'll bring up some more food tomorrow. Over. It's three days since Steve and Lydia left advanced base camp to make their big push. Rest is now vital to build the fitness they will need higher on the mountain. Well, how'd it go? Uh, oh, I just got down from Camp 1 today. She set up Camp 1 the day before yesterday. Yeah, we were going to come down yesterday, but Steve Monks arrived with a load just as I was going to leave. And he said, well, rest and hang out and get acclimatised and do some more work tomorrow. But today I'm stuffed. Absolutely wasted. Had nothing to eat or drink yet. Well, what did you gain yesterday? Just out of Just acclimatisation. We just hung out. Sorted out camp one. Yeah. Dug it out a bit more. It's a bit hard to find though. Jeff came up bringing a load out yesterday in whiteout conditions and went straight past the tent. Left a load up above us and we couldn't see. He was wandering around the whiteout and he lost the fixed rope three times and then he fell off the edge of the mountain and all sorts yeah. of epic things. So what's the plan from here? Well, we're going to have a couple of days rest and then we'll go up again and whatever needs to be done, we'll do. Get right on. By then, people should have Camp 2 fixed up. <laughs> and people should have checked out the Dinosaur Ridge. And uh, maybe we can think about going for it in a few days' time. From Camp 1, the route lies over the snow dome. Beyond, the Dinosaur Ridge bars the way to the proposed site of Camp 2, the base from which a summit bit would be launched. Its crest, bristling with massive cornices of wind-blown snow, the ridge resembles the armour-plated back of a prehistoric reptile. From advanced base camp, it looked straightforward. At Camp 1, Jeff Jackson and Jeanette Harrison take up the story. It's the morning of the 15th. I'm really blowing a gale outside right now. Jeanette's all kitted out. I don't know, she seems more anxious than the rest of us to get out in this weather. It's this really is blowing. Jeanette Harrison, oh, yeah. evening of the 15th of October from Camp 1. Today was horrendous weather, too windy really to go up on the ridge, so uh, Steve and Jeff had a rest day. I went down to pick up a load of food that Harry had left. Jeff Jackson here again, still at <coughs> Camp 1. Today's the 17th. Uh, Jeanette and I just got back to completely knackered, um, horrible day out on the ridge. It was initially pretty nice getting up there. Uh, it seemed like we were going to be able to do it, no problem. As soon as we hit the beginning of the ridge, going to Camp 2, <laughs> very cold, constant winds. Um, we just decided that we weren't going to make it to Camp 2. 
in this kind of weather. So we were going to turn back. Uh, immediately when we turned back, it must have been 60 mile an hour constant winds. Harrison from Camp 1. Well, things didn't go quite well as expected today. But now we're back and cozy in our tent and hopefully we'll be able to fix out the ropes all the way to Camp 2 tomorrow. Steve's not feeling at all well. Uh, I think it's probably mild altitude sickness. <laughs> started on the dialogue, so hopefully that will do the trick. I'm completely see how we're wasted right now. I think Jeanette is as well, and um, there's a good chance that we're going to have a rest day tomorrow. And Steve Monk's feeling a lot better. Him and Steve Berry might be able to go up and go the rest of the way to two. The high winds of winter have arrived, a month before they are expected. A savage storm forces Steve Berry to order the climbers off the mountain. At advanced base camp, it is very frustrating for the climbers who have so nearly secured camp two. There is only a brief period between the monsoon and the winter when the mountain can be climbed. The thought that winter could come early and close that opportunity is a depressing one. They are aware too that the yak train bringing vital supplies to base camp could be delayed by snow blocking the passes below. In total isolation, there is nothing to do but play a waiting game. Hi, it's Harry McCall here, uh, located at Advanced Base Camp. It's the 7th of October, about 3.30 p.m. It's the second day of the uh, snowstorm. Um, we're all a bit pissed off with them, obviously. We'd like to have uh, gone on with the climbing. There's nine people now at Advanced Base Camp. We're getting a bit worried because we've done a check on the food supply and if we all stay up here, we're just going to eat away at our mountain supplies. <coughs> so we've decided to uh, make a tactical withdrawal from the mountain until conditions get better on the mountain. This is Harry McCauley for BBC News. Advanced Base Camp, Camp Possum. On October the 12th, the sky clears, though the snow plume from the summit shows the wind speed is increasing. Winter has arrived. Back on the mountain, Camp 2 is at last established. The way to the summit is open, but for how long? The push is now on, the task to rebuild the pyramid of supplies and climbers on the mountain. The plan is to place as many climbers as high on the mountain as possible. Then they will go for the summit alpine style, carrying all their needs for survival on their backs. At Camp 2, they are poised for the final assault when Harry McCauley relays the bad news from Timpu. Hello, Camp 2. This is Advanced Base Camp. Are you receiving me? Over. Hello, Harry. We read you loud and clear. It's pretty calm up here tonight. What's the news on supplies? Over. The yaks are unable to get through due to the heavy snows lower down, and there will be no yaks in the future. The radio operator and base camp crew will have to return, or will return, to Buntang in four to five days with or without us. Over. We expected this problem with the food, Harry. But Timpu can't just tell us to pull out because of it. If the Butanese want to leave, then... It's up to them, just let them go. From up here, it looks like they've got a good chance of going for the top in a few days, H. We've got enough food up here to keep us going. All we need is five days. Just five days, H. Five days of good weather. Winter is closing in, and their supply train is cut off. Base camp rations are down to rice and one pot of jam. Logic dictates retreat to abandon the mountain and head for the valley below. But it's taken three years to reach this point. They choose to go for the summit. Jeff Jackson here, camp two. The wind is just gusting and blowing almost constantly. Real distressing this weather. Um, it's the 20th now and we've only got about at the very, very outset, till the 29th, we have to be running down this mountain and getting out of here. This is Steve Monks here, um, recording at Camp 2. 
22,000 or so we were up here and we were feeling the effects of the altitude and just, just the waiting up here, waiting for the for the weather to improve so we can get out. Mentally it's just so so draining of your reserves, of your, your determination. It just wears you away. I'm up here by myself now. <clears throat> Being the 21st, <clears throat> we need to get going if we're going to get to the summit on this thing. That's all there is to it. Um, I'll probably stay here tomorrow and the next day waiting for some people to come up. Now, whether the weather's too bad down there or what, I, I don't know. And all we need to do is climb about a few hundred more feet and then we can make a go for the summit. But it's hard to, when you get close to the end of a climb like this. I mean, so many things have to come together for it to happen. And the more and more I get more discouraged and not thinking that it's going to come about. Just have to wait and see. I figure two days of waiting and uh, it's over. Stephen Berry, 24th of October. We've had to give up the climb. The weather has finally cheated us. We've done everything right over the last three years. Every piece of the jigsaw seemed to have fitted together perfectly in, over that time, but the last few pieces of that jigsaw have just been blown away in the wind. We'll have to wait now for the uh, Indian Army helicopters to evacuate us from base camp. It's invariable that people ask you whether it was a waste of time if you don't get up it, but it's just, it's not true at all. So we didn't conquer our mountain, but we lived with her for quite a while and she gave us some experiences that none of us are likely to forget very quickly. The only battle is is not really against the mountain, but within ourselves, um, to push ourselves and to see how far we can push our own limits. The mountain's really just passive. It's, it's a vehicle to see what we, as human beings, can, can achieve. By the end of October, supplies are totally exhausted, and with their retreat through the valleys cut off, they have no alternative but to return to base camp and await their evacuation by the Indian Army. a trek across the unforgiving terrain of New Zealand, all in the aid of charity. Next today, Lazio versus AC Milan in Football Italia.